between the life of your cell and its death, there is a very thin line. It's a literal line. It's thinner than a strand of hair. It's 8,000 times thinner than paper. It's flexible. And it's the reason your cells don't burst or stop. Let's talk about cell membrane. A lot of studies regarding cell membrane was done on the membranes of RBC. Very early on, it was established that the membrane of a cell contains a special type of lipid called as phospholipids. And they look something like this. The next question in their mind was, what was the thickness of this membrane? They collected phospholipids from the RBCs and spread them on water. So the hypothesis was that whatever phospholipids you spread on the surface of water, it forms a certain shape and it occupies a certain surface area. If it equals the surface area of the regular RBC, we can correlate that the phospholipids present had come from the surface. But after the experimental results, they realized that the surface area that was present on water was twice the surface area of RBC. That's when they realized that they were dealing with two layers of lipids and not just one. And thus came the concept of a lipid bilayer in the cell membrane. This was put forth by Gorter and Grendel. Few years later, based upon electron microscopy evidence, we were able to find out that there are actually three layers within the lipid bilayer. In the electron micrographs, they appear as inner white core surrounded by two dark regions. The white core represents the phospholipids. This is the lipid bilayer. And the dark layers are proteins. So the proteins are present above and below the lipid bilayer. The tail of the phospholipid created hydrophobic zones. It was surrounded by two hydrophilic zones, above and below. This model was called as davson danelli model. There was just one problem with the model. It was not able to explain cell membrane transport, how molecules cross through the membrane into and out of the cell. An improved model of the structure of cell membrane was proposed by Singer and Nicholson. This is a widely accepted model and it is called as the fluid mosaic model. The phospholipids in the lipid bilayer are referred to as the fluid. The membrane is called as a mosaic due to the proteins that are present. Unlike the previous model, which assumed that protein layer was present uh, on either sides of the membrane, Singer and Nicholson were able to deduce that proteins were embedded in small pockets in various parts of the lipid bilayer. Therefore, mosaic because of the proteins embedded. They further used a term called as quasi-fluid to describe the phospholipid. So, what does quasi-fluid mean? It means that something which is not a true fluid acts like a fluid under certain conditions. Why is this important? This is important because it can then allow for horizontal movement of the substances embedded within the lipid bilayer. In addition to protein, Singer and Nicholson also said there were carbohydrates and cholesterol molecules in the cell membrane. In a cell membrane, phospholipids are the major components. Phospholipids are made up of two components, the polar head which usually faces the aqueous environment within a cell. So it could mean outside the cell as well as the cytoplasm inside the cell. It had a non-polar tail which was hydrophobic. So it faced away from these aqueous environments. Proteins are scattered throughout the lipid bilayer. Usually, in a cell membrane, for every 25 lipid molecules, we have one protein molecule present. But this ratio can depend upon what the cell actually does. So, for example, the inner membrane of mitochondria. So, inner mitochondria, it actually has one protein for every 
15 phospholipids. It makes sense because inner mitochondrial membrane is quite busy. There are lots of biochemical reactions happening there. But if you take myelin, which acts as an electrical insulator, so myelin, it has only one protein for every 70 lipids. This also makes sense because for it to be an insulator, it needs more lipids than proteins. The proteins found on the membrane could be of two types. It could be an integral protein or it could be a peripheral protein. Integral proteins are usually buried within the cell membrane, whereas peripheral proteins are present on the surface. Sometimes there are a certain type of integral protein which can extend to outside of the cell as well as inside of the cell. These are called as transmembrane proteins. There are few other proteins which can act as a small tube allowing the ion movement through the cell membrane and these are called as channel proteins. We therefore observe that protein distribution in the cell membrane is not uniform. Cholesterol is also present in the membrane and it contributes to the fluidity of the membrane. In addition to the lipids and proteins that are present in the cell membrane, they also have carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are present either as a glycoprotein or as a glycolipid. Glycoproteins are a combination of sugar units with proteins. So, if there are surface proteins and they have sugar units on them, they are usually glycoproteins. But if the sugar units are directly bound to the lipids, then they are called as glycolipids. The main function of carbohydrates on a cell membrane is for cell recognition function. When all these components like proteins, carbohydrates and cholesterol are freely allowed to move within the cell membrane, that property is termed as fluidity. Let's look at membrane fluidity. So, we have a piece of cell membrane with its proteins, right? But the thing is, it doesn't stay in one place. But the structures within a cell membrane are not static. They keep changing. So, the fluid part of the fluid mosaic model refers to how the nature of the lipids allow the proteins to move sideways through the membrane. Almost like people moving through a crowded swimming pool. The fluid nature of the membrane is also important from the point of view of functions like cell growth and secretion. The cell membrane easily accommodates the growing size of the cell. On the other hand, the cell membrane can pinch off a portion of itself to give out the cell secretion. Fluidity also affects other processes like endocytosis and cell division. So, does the membrane fluidity ever change? The short answer is yes. The fluidity depends upon the lipid composition of the cell membrane as well as the temperature in which the cells exist. The phospholipids can have different types of fatty acids. They could either be uh, saturated fatty acids with its long linear uh, nonpolar tail or they could be uh, unsaturated fatty acids. So these are usually shorter and they have a lot of kinks or twists in them. And in general, when you compare the properties of um, saturated and unsaturated fatty acids, unsaturated ones have a lower melting point than saturated ones. Now look at the composition of these two pictures. We can clearly see that the one on the left has a higher proportion of saturated fatty acids, whereas the one on the right has a higher proportion of unsaturated fatty acids. Saturated fatty acids can be easily packed very tight together. Therefore, it can lead to decrease in the fluidity. On the other hand, such tight packing is not possible for unsaturated fatty acids. And therefore, it naturally has increased fluidity. 
The presence of cholesterol within the cell membrane can also affect packing. What cholesterol does is that it makes the fatty acids to stick to each other even better. So it can either make the membrane rigid or it can make the membrane weak. The cell usually tries to find a balance between these two states. Temperature is directly proportional to molecular movement. So when we heat a certain substance, we are supplying it energy, right? So that causes the molecules within these substances to take up the energy and vibrate more. So when the temperature is high and it's hot, the molecules start vibrating very vigorously. And in the process, they push away other molecules. So the membrane is not able to hold shape and therefore it becomes too fluid. On the other hand, when it becomes very cold, the molecules don't have any energy to vibrate, right? So in that process, their movement is restricted. So it creates a more rigid cell membrane. If it becomes too rigid, it can break. We can say that temperature is directly proportional to the membrane fluidity. One of the most important functions of plasma membrane is the transport of molecules across it. The membrane is selectively permeable to some molecules that are present on either side of it. There are two ways to look at membrane transport. It could either be passive or active. Passive transport does not use energy, while active transport uses energy. But why is that? In our body, there is usually an unequal distribution of substances across the plasma membrane. In case of passive transport, the movement of molecules is usually from a region of higher concentration towards lower concentration, or it could be said as towards the concentration gradient, and such movement needs no energy. Polar molecules cannot pass through the non-polar lipid bilayer. Therefore, they need a carrier protein attached to the membrane to facilitate their transport. Even through the channel, the movement is towards the concentration gradient and hence requires no energy. In active transport, the movement of molecules is from a region of lower concentration towards higher concentration. So it's basically moving against the concentration gradient and that sort of movement requires energy in the form of ATP. Neutral solute molecules passively move through the cell membrane. It is called as simple diffusion. If the molecules need the help of a carrier protein, it is called as facilitated diffusion. Active transport can happen via a carrier protein or a channel protein. So, movement of ions passively across membrane is simple diffusion. If it is through a carrier, it is facilitated transport. Water requires a special channel protein called as aquaporin, therefore it comes under facilitated transport. Active transport could be carrier mediated or pump mediated. The most popular example for a pump protein is the sodium potassium pump. So this is your plasma membrane. and The pump is right at the center of it. So let this be outside of the cell and inside of the cell. The function of the sodium potassium pump is to push out three sodium molecules while simultaneously pulling in two potassium molecules. This pump plays a major role in how our muscles and nervous systems work. Based upon the number of solute molecules, facilitated transport could be either uniport or co-transport. In uniport, we have a single molecule moving in a certain direction. Based upon the direction in which the two molecules are traveling, co-transport could be of two types. If both the molecules are simultaneously moving in the same direction, it is a symport. But if the molecules are simultaneously moving in the opposite direction, it is called as antiport.